Hi again, this is Andy, KE4GKP, and welcome back to the Ham Whisperer and Lesson 25 in the Technician Operator Element 2 exam. In this lesson, we go over the T7C questions and antenna measurements and troubleshooting. Right, the questions in the T7C section cover measuring standing wave ratio, dummy loads, and feed line failure modes. Let's get started. What is the primary purpose of a dummy load? The primary purpose of a dummy load is to prevent the radiation of signals when making tests. So essentially you screw this into the back of your antenna output on your transmitter and a dummy load allows you to test your transmitter up to a specified power without producing a signal. And something as simple as a light bulb can act as long as you don't exceed the wattage of the bulb. However, there are special devices that are designed to do this and I recommend using them vice a light bulb. One of the things you want to remember when you're testing your equipment is you never, never, never want to key your transmitter when there's nothing hooked up to the antenna output. It can cause serious damage to your transmitter and it can put, take you off the air for a long time if it breaks it. Which of the following instruments can be used to determine if an antenna is resonant at a desired operating frequency? All right, what well, this is is an antenna analyzer. And what you use it for is to analyze the antenna, not your transmitter, which is a frequency counter, but what you're doing here is analyzing the antenna itself. And if you look at the answers on the exam, this one is the most obvious to this question. What in general terms is standing wave ratio or SWR? What standing wave ratio is is a measure of how well a load is matched to a transmission line. So basically how well in sync your transmitter is with your feed line and your antenna. Now if you want you want to make sure that you're using the right antenna for the band you want to transmit on and that you are using the proper feed line or coaxial cable um, to provide the, the right impedance match between the transmitter and the, the antenna. Otherwise your signal is going to get reflected back and heat up your feed line and could do serious damage to your transmitter if the ratio is high enough. What reading on an SWR meter indicates a perfect impedance match between the antenna and the feed line? Now the SWR meter is going to give you a ratio and the perfect ratio is one to one and that's what you're looking for always. Now no antenna is perfect so you're never going to be able to achieve that one to one but if you can get anything below a two to one ratio you should be able to get a decent signal out, but the closer you can get to one to one is ideal. What is the approximate SWR value above which the protection circuits in most solid state transmitters begin to reduce transmitter power? All right, if you are working with more than a two to one SWR, your modern transmitter is going to go into self defense mode and reduce the power to avoid damaging itself. And this means that a lot of your signal, a two to one ratio, means a lot of your signal is getting reflected back at your transmitter by it's going out and radiating through the antenna. And this can seriously damage your equipment with the signal coming back at it. So anything over 2 to 1, your transmitter is pretty much going to start reducing power to avoid damaging itself. What does an SWR reading of 4 to 1 mean? Well, the answer is an impedance mismatch. So to get uh, that low SWR, like closest to 1 to 1, your transmitter's impedance needs to match your feed line and the antenna. And when you get a high SWR like this, it usually means that there's some sort of corruption in your feed line, like you got some water in it, or there's a short, or you're using the wrong antenna for the band that you're trying to operate on. Regardless, a lot of signals getting bounced back at the transmitter, and antenna tuners can sometimes fix impedance mismatches of this, this magnitude. However, uh, if you got something like this straight off the bat, I would go and check, make sure your feed line and antenna are hooked up properly. What happens to power loss in a feed line? it is converted into heat. So any power that you shoot out that doesn't get radiated through that antenna, basically all it does is heat up the wire. So if you have a high w SWR or have other problems, uh, you notice your feed line's getting hot, I, I would start checking your equipment, make sure your connections are good and that everything's hooked up properly. What instrument other than an SWR meter could you use to determine if a feed line and antenna are properly matched? And the answer on the exam is a directional watt meter, and this one's a little bit obscure, so th this is one you got to kind of remember. So SWR is basically how much of your signal is being reflected back at your transmitter through your feed line. So you're looking for some sort of wattage coming back and forth. So a directional watt meter can determine how much is coming back compared to what is going out. So you're looking for direction of watts, and you can find that in a directional watt meter. Which of the following is the most common cause for failure of coaxial cable? The answer is moisture contamination is the most common cause for failure in coax. If water gets in your coax, you're pretty much done. It quickly corrodes the shielding in the wire and can cut connectivity to the antenna. It can skyrocket your SWR and possibly do damage to your equipment. 
So well, you want to make sure your coax insulation is solid and waterproof all the ends and outdoor connections with silicon or some other waterproofing substance, but moisture contamination is bad for coax. Why should the outer jacket of coaxial cable be resistant to ultraviolet light? Well, the answer is the ultraviolet light can damage the jacket and allow water to enter the cable, which puts us back into this moisture damaging coax thing again. Now, coax cable and parachutes are alike because you don't want to bargain shop for them. You don't want to get the cheap stuff. You want to get good quality things, and that saves a lot of headaches. And UV can wreck the outer jacket of cheap coax in just a few months exposure to the sun, so be sure to buy the quality stuff that's resistant to ultraviolet light. What is the disadvantage of air core coaxial cable when compared to foam or solid dielectric types? And this goes back to the water thing again. It the answer is it requires special techniques to prevent water absorption. Now I've never used this stuff because I live in a fairly wet area, so this stuff would get ruined in a heartbeat for me. So uh, if you use it, if you're in the desert or something like that, this isn't so bad, but just remember if there's a problem with it, a problem with coax is probably caused by water. Which of the following is a common use of coaxial cable? The answer is carrying RF signals between a radio and an antenna. Now, coaxial cable or coax is essentially the, the, the cable of choice for carrying um, signals between your transceiver and your antenna. Um, this is also the same type of cable they use to basically cable your house. So your television cable is usually run through a type of coaxial cable. And there's various kinds and um, impedances and whatnot. You're going to become very familiar with coaxial cable um, as you put together your station and you work as an amateur. So of the, the possible choices for this question, a common use of coaxial cable is carrying RF signals between a radio and an antenna. What does a dummy load consist of? A dummy load consists of a non-inductive resistor and a heat sink. So what a dummy load is, is it, it's basically a fake antenna. Um, it's essentially, it mimics the load produced by an antenna, which allows you to test your transceiver at, or your transmitter specifically, at full strength or at a higher wattage without producing a signal. So basically what happens, that resistor in there basically provides the resistance which would mimic that the load of the antenna and the heat sink is there because if you're doing this at power, it's going to get very hot and it's, need to cool, it's going to need to cool off very quickly. So a dummy load consists, consists of a non-inductive resistor and a heat sink. And that's the end of the review, and now it's time for the T7C quiz. So take out a pencil and paper, number 1 through 13. When you're done with the quiz, be sure to go to hamwhisper.com. You can find the answers there under the exam answers page and just look for the T7C link. I'm going to go through the questions pretty quick, so if you need more time, simply pause the video and take all the time you need. And with that, let's get started with the quiz. Question 1. What is the primary purpose of a dummy load? A. To prevent the radiation of signals when making tests. B. To prevent overmodulation of your transmitter. C. To improve the radiation from your antenna. Or D. To improve the signal to noise ratio of your receiver. Question 2. Which of the following instruments can be used to determine if an antenna is resonant at the desired operating frequency? A. A VTVM B. An antenna analyzer C. A Q meter or D. A frequency counter What in general terms is standing wave ratio or SWR? A. A measure of how well a load is matched to a transmission line B. The ratio of high to low impedance in a feed line C. The transmitter efficiency ratio or D, an indication of the quality of your station's ground connection. Question 4. What reading on an SWR meter indicates a perfect impedance match between the antenna and the feed line? A, 2 to 1, B, 1 to 3, C, 1 to 1, or D, 10 to 1? Question 5. What is the approximate SWR value above which the protection circuits in most solid state transmitters begin to reduce transmitter power? A, 2 to 1, B, 1 to 2, C, 6 to 1, or D, 10 to 1. Question 6. What does an SWR reading of 4 to 1 mean? A, an antenna loss of 4 decibels. B, a good impedance match. C, an antenna gain of 4. Or D, an impedance mismatch. Question 7. What happens to power lost in a feed line? A, it increases the SWR. B. It comes back into your transmitter and could cause damage. C. It is converted into heat. 
or D, it can cause distortion of your signal. Question 8. What instrument other than an SWR meter could you use to determine if a feed line and antenna are properly matched? A. Voltmeter B. Ohm meter C. Iambic pentameter or D. Directional watt meter Question 9. Which of the following is the most common cause for failure of coaxial cables? A. Moisture contamination B. Gamma rays C. The velocity factor exceeds 1.0 or D. Overloading Question 10. Why should the outer jacket of coaxial cable be resistant to ultraviolet light? A. Ultraviolet resistant jackets prevent harmonic radiation. B. Ultraviolet light can increase losses in the cable's jacket. C. Ultraviolet and RF signals can mix together, causing interference. Or D. Ultraviolet light can damage the jacket and allow water to enter the cable. Question 11. What is the disadvantage of air core coaxial cable when compared to foam or solid dielectric types? A it has more loss per foot, B, it cannot be used for VHF or UHF antennas, C, it requires special techniques to prevent water absorption, or D, it cannot be used at below freezing temperatures. Question 12. Which of the following is a common use of coaxial cable? A, carrying DC power from a vehicle battery to a mobile radio, B, carrying RF signals between a radio and an antenna, C. Securing masts, tubing, and other cylindrical objects on towers. Or D. Connecting data signals from a TNC to a computer. And question 13. What does a dummy load consist of? A. A high gain amplifier and a TR switch. B. A non-inductive resistor and a heat sink. C. A low voltage power supply and a DC relay. Or D. A 50 ohm reactance used to terminate a transmission line. And that's it for Lesson 25 and the T7C questions. Now that you're done with a quiz, go to handwhisper.com and check your answers. And until next time in Lesson 26, this is Andy, KE4GKP, saying 73s, and I hope to hear you on the air soon.